So the next segment is with, deals with the uh, PMUs, and this have to be contrasted with this uh, conventional meters that are called SCADA, provide SCADA measurements. So if you want to compare, SCADA provides power, voltage, and current magnitudes, only magnitudes. It reports a measurement every one or four seconds, and the synchronization is poor across areas. OK? Now, PMUs, on the other hand, promise to measure not only amplitude, magnitude, but also phase, and the entire, therefore, phasors. And by taking the derivative of the phase, you can find the frequency. As I mentioned, although the conventional meters give rise to quadratic equations, PMUs, because they go with the Ohm's law, not the power, give rise to linear equations. And they get 30 to 60 per second. And the synchronization is very precise because they get GPS synchronization. So Terry Boston, the CEO of uh, Pennsylvania Jesse, Massachusetts, PJM is the, one of the largest uh, uh, operators. So it's like going from an X-ray to an MRI of the grid, basically. That's uh, what they provide. So just for us communications uh, people to feel at home, basically you have an analog voltage or current transformer. They provide this uh, sinusoidal waveform which you low pass filter and with ADC and you get GPS synchronized sampling clock. So the sampling is very synchronized. And then at the output you get both the amplitude and the sine cosine. So you can uh, correlation, you can perform correlations with the sliding this DFT since you have both sine and cosine components. These are the quadrature in-phase components. And you can uh, also estimate other unknowns, such as the DC and dumping effects of the sinusoids if they are available. So the major costs in deploying PMUs, and PMUs have been deployed in these areas, there are about 100 every year that are being deployed in the US. So it costs to acquire to uh, install and network. And uh, a major question that arises is uh, if you have a choice, where do you put the PMU? Since you cannot put them everywhere, at least in the near future. <laughs> so the criteria that have been proposed are either topological <laughs> observability or estimation accuracy that are somewhat related. What we came up with is an approach that is known in statistics as optimal experimental design approach. So if you remember, per node, we have a measurement model that is linear. And we utilize the conventional measurements as a prior. If you are familiar with Bayesian statistics, then or you can consider it as a regularizer x cut scada. So our argument is that the true uh, vector is basically random and is distributed with mean, whatever we have found. And this goes back to your question of do we consider them random or deterministic? You can consider them as random as well. And here, the mean of the Gaussian is taken to be the conventional ones and the covariance is their uh, confidence interval or uncertainty. So then we designate a vector an. You can call it assignment vector. For every node n, this an takes the value 0 or 1. So if you decide that an equals 1, then you will put a PMU at this 
bus at this node of the network. If you decide it to be zero, you will not install it. Okay. So <coughs> the covariance of this estimator x given this prior is given by this expression. For example, you can if you, this one is zero, right, then this is like the least squares estimation expression. The least squares covariance method. But this one also provides you a prior. This utilizes the scalar measurements as well. So then we can formulate an optimization problem. You tell me, for example, that out of capital N possible locations, I want to install K PMU. K could be out of 1,000 notation, uh, locations, K could be 10. Okay? So that means this assignment vector, when you take the inner product with all one, if only 10 of the centuries have one, then it should be equal to K. Right? So what we do is we formulate the covariance matrix. You want this thing to be small, right? So you can take either the maximum eigenvalue uh, of, uh, or you could have taken the trace even. But if you take the maximum eigenvalue of this and you minimize it over A, that means you, this one will go down, right? Because you have a matrix. If the error is a matrix, you need to find a scalar version of the matrix, either eigenvalue or the trace to minimize it. So, you can do a relaxation, so instead of a, this is a difficult problem because it's an integer program, and you can relax it to be an interval between 0 and 1, and we have shown that this one can be solved efficiently using a scalable uh, projecting gradient algorithm. So here, I'm showing the maximum medium value, and uh, what we get with a, the an upper bound and a lower bound of this expression of the maximum eigenvalue value as a function of the number of instrumented buses. And let's suppose that the, you are in installing five buses, uh, 20 buses. Then if you randomly employ them, uh, place them, then the error can be as much as two, three times higher, right? So that shows that you can carefully select where to put the different buses if you have a limited number of them using optimization theory tools such as semi-definite relaxation. Now, let me move on to touch a little bit more on additional learning and inference issues. So the first major problem that I looked at, just to review things, was what? It was power system state estimation, right? So how, given power measurements or amplitudes, you can find voltage. And if you noticed, I used either the traditional Gauss-Newton or modern techniques that get you closer to the global optics. Then we moved to the possibility of using linear equations as well when PMUs are available. Then I said, yes, but if I'm going to reduce complexity, I need to go to decentralized. Right. And privacy preserving approaches. Then I generalized the estimation to not only finding voltages, but also places where parameters that, you know, can be changed in a network. And then PMUs can be optimally placed in, to help me in this task. But the key task was state estimation, one way or the other. There are other important learning and inference issues that especially the systems oriented, signals and systems oriented expertise can be very helpful. And the first one I want to talk about deal with cascading failures that cost a lot. What happens in this case? you know, bad weather or whatever, uh, you know, lightning or, or uh, rain, 
one line drops and then the power has to be redistributed, redistributed and the one line that was designed to carry that much power all of a sudden has to carry much more power and that fails and successively one after the other fail and then blackout is being created. So we used uh, in order to try to model these cascades, cascade failures and try to identify them, they used the linear DC model that I told you in the modeling part where power is linearly dependent on phase differences. And the challenge is really the following. In every internal or local area, the updates of all the line values are very frequent, but they happen every second or every f four seconds. But the external system, the cascade is happening infrequently. So think of the Catalonia, right? So you have a, an operator, its own operator. Then there are tie lines with Granada or Andalusia. You don't get too frequent information of what happens in Granada. So if a line drops in Granada, then you will not figure it out very fast. So the internal states will be denoted by theta i and theta e, the external. I will also use the graph before the edges to be e before and e prime after if something happens. So at the very high level, the problem statement of identifying cascading outages is the following. If I give you the topology before and after for the internal states, suppose 12 and 12.01, before, so suppose at 12.01 something happened. So I give you what was the topology inside in the Catalonia area 12 and 12.01. And I give you at 12 o'clock before what happened in Granada. So can you find, but I don't give you 12.01 what happened in Granada. And something happened in Granada. So is it possible for you to identify the topology B that is described by this matrix B, the bus admittance matrix? and find which lines have been in outage. That's the problem statement. Is that clear? So you know Catalonia before or after, all the network. You know Granada after, eh, before, you don't know after. And you want to find something that went wrong at 12.01 in Granada. Do you have a hope of figuring it out at 12.01? So the question, you can ask, how can I know if I don't measure? Well, there is a conservation of principle. So the conservation principle that takes place, right? So if something happened in Granada, it trickled down power redistribution through the tie lines, even to Catalonia, right? So you try to measure changes in your own neck of the woods that have been caused by others. Remember, whatever comes in goes out. That, if the network is connected, that means if something even happened outside, it will affect you. Now, the question is, can I figure it out, how much it has affected me? So people at the very beginning were doing exhaustive search. So they were saying, if that line had dropped, what would have happened to me? What measurements I should have had by the conservation? OK, this measurement. If that has happened, what measurement should I have here? So they exhaustively search over all possible drop lines. And the one that fits your data the most, the internal data the most, is the winner. So that was the approach that was uh, pursued by this gentleman, which is impossible if you have more than two lines. Because even 1,000 choose two is combinatorially complex. You can imagine. 
So this is where we came in, and you know, with a good graph theory background, uh, how my student recognized that uh, you know you can have this form. You can write the bus admittance metric. Remember what is p equals b theta plus noise. Here we collect the nodal powers. This is the network bus admittance matrix, and this is the nodal voltage phases that we are after. What Hal noticed is that it is possible to go from nodes to lines in using this difference of canonical vectors AM minus EN when a line L connects nodes M and N. Then she noticed that you can basically write this bus admittance matrix as a superposition of matrices that bear this form. They're basically plus minus ones at some point, Mn, plus one in the diagonal, minus one in the off diagonal, and zero elsewhere. And the thing that she noticed is that if you consider with tildes the difference topology after minus topology before, and measurement after minus measurement before, then you can write a linear regression model where these entries of the unknown M sub L are zero if the line is contained in the difference graph. So if there is an outage, or rather, if there is no outage in this line, if this line is the same before and after, then you get a zero. But if the line is different before and after, then you get something non-zero. OK? So basically, she formed a linear system of equations that control the presence of a night that, that uh, uh, demonstrate or, or capture the presence of an outage or not in a regression coefficient vector m. And so if you have a sparse regression to solve, then she demonstrated that you can check which entries of this regression coefficient vector are non-zero. And by using the Lasso approach, you can find out whether outages are present or not. This, is, this was quite remarkable. Because if you look at uh, an IEEE standard 300 bus, and here we show the detection probability of the exhaustive search, the optimum, the orthogonal mar matching pursuit, which is a one method of solving this problem, and this is called uh, uh, coordinate descent method (CD). If you have two outages, you get that much time. Uh, that much detection probability, correct detection probability, that you correctly identify the right things. However, the running times are very indicative of the edge that we have. If from the 118 bus, you go to 300 bus, to 2,000 bus system, the exhaustive search cannot perform any exhaustive search here with 2,000 buses. The OMP is, the running time is uh, less than uh, uh, 10 to the minus 2 seconds, or 3, 0.03 seconds. And this is 0.04 seconds. So it is quite remarkable that you can pick up the two outages extremely fast, which is impossible with the rest of the technology. Another problem that is of interest in uh, that is related to what we know in you know, communication systems and signal processing is the so-called mode estimation problems. What happens is you have voltage oscillations in voltage, frequency, and power flows that can lead to a uh, breakup of the grid. So they are between 0.1 and 1 hertz. And uh, you can try to do uh, harmonic syst uh, estimation of harmonics. But the challenges are the fact that things are nonlinear, time varying, and the frequencies can be closely spaced. So people have used linearized equation 
linearized uh, uh, continuous time differential equations to capture the variability of the uh, voltage parameters of interest or voltage or current or power and they allow sometimes the probing of a signal Q like, like a reference input or external input to regulate and eliminate the oscillations in the system. So the one possibility is to bring a model, it's called swing model, uh, that means it requires estimation of this AX and BU and use, go from the physics to find the modes. The other approach, which is more near and dear to signal processing experts, it is to look at X of T as it varies with time and try to do estimation. Uh, what I want to show you here is how power changes across time. So the ambient power is a little bit of a uh, oscillation you have an, around a nominal. So this is over a line. And this is a transient ring down. Sometimes you are interested about this transient to figure out. Again, you go back to ambient, but then if you deviate tremendously from this frequency, you can drive the entire uh, system uh, unstable. So people have used uh, harmonic retrieval methods pretty much like in communications, people use uh, carrier uh, synchronization problems, uh, estimation of the carrier frequency, and adaptive node analysis using the least mean squares error and the recursively squares to identify the sinusoids and track their variability. The last topic before the break is the one that relates to load forecasting. Uh, I think I want to cover that if you give me another five minutes. 30 minutes you will not exceed, be exceeded. So in many cases, it is very important to know the load. So how much power is required at what node? OK? And for example, uh, remember we, we said that uh, sometimes, you know, you will see it later on in the power flow problems that you need to know the load. And it is very useful at different time scales. Sometimes you need to know in, in order to complete the operation that is called economic dispatch. Economic dispatch refers to which generators you will take to generate how much, right? And that you have to solve that every hour. But also, every week, you have to solve load forecasting problems for reliability purposes, but even every year to deploy transmission lines if uh, demand is more in different areas or increasing in different areas or decreasing. So there have been all kinds of approaches, uh, ARMA and neural networks uh, type nonlinear approaches to predict the power. What people have not looked at is that the patterns of consumption are not only similar in time. So more or less people consume much more after they come back from work, right? And in the morning rather than in the middle of the day. But also in space. So people in residential neighborhoods tend to have the same needs. So there is a special correlation. So basically, a, a problem that we set up to solve is the following. Suppose that you collect the consumption of power or the demand of power at different sites in as rows of this matrix. And suppose that you have these measurements available at different times. Okay, Time could be hours, could be days, could be of any resolution. So in some places you, you don't have any measurements because either they have not installed meters or there's malfunction. So you need to impute this data. In other times, ahead of time, you also want to predict, right? So there are question marks also to the right. So our idea was to pour, place all these measurements into a matrix, X, and postulate that this matrix can be decomposed into a low rank plus a product 
of non-negative matrices A and B. So the low rank, we put it there to account for periodicities uh, in day, week, or month. And uh, the uh, non-negative matrix AB was put there to capture clusters. I don't know whether you, you're familiar with this, but for example, uh, let me see. You know that if you have a, if you have, if you have a, a sinusoid, like suppose that xt is e, e to the j omega naught t. Now you can write it as e to the j omega naught plus e to the j omega naught t minus one, right? And this is like a constant times x t minus one, right? So basically, what did I show you here? I show you that if you have a complex exponential, then you have a first order recursion, right? x t equals constant times x t minus 1, right? So if you put it on a vector, the first order one column is a scalar multiple of another, right? That's what I said. So basically, if you have one sinusoid, you have rank 1. If you have two sinusoids, a periodic, Mr. Fourier said that periodic signals comprise, uh, uh, are comprised of, uh, of uh, complex exponentials. So if you have five, it turns out that you have rank five. So, so low rank means periodic. That's what I wanted to say. Also, trust me that uh, the, if this one, if this B, it can capture different neighborhoods, spatial approaches. And it's not negative because we're measuring power, right? So the question is, is it identifiable? So if I give you x, can you find the L and the AB? Because I give you only x. You don't know. I just want to tell you that this problem is fundamental. It's not trivial. Uh, if I give you x and I ask you to find the sum of the components, L and AB, take only one entry, right? If I give you x m n equals L m n plus whatever a b something m n. Okay, so the fact that is additive tells me that if you have on the left hand side twelve, you can write it. Uh, you can write it as whatever you want, right? You understand what I'm saying? If you have a twelve only, you you cannot identify the constituent components. But the structure helps you to do that. The fact that it's low rank gives you some additional information. And this is exactly where uh, what we have exploited here. We have written the least squares fit. This is x minus l minus a, b. We want to minimize that. The projection operator here shows that you may have some misses. So just to capture that, when you write that, just keep the misses. OK? That's what this one says. But then L star is the nu nuclear norm. If you have not, if you're a power engineer, I'm sure you have not heard about the nuclear norm. The nuclear norm of a matrix is the sum of its singular values. All of them. Okay? So if you have a few singular values, that means your uh, your sum is small because it's a positive, right? So by forcing the nuclear norm of a matrix to be small, it's like forcing the matrix to have low rank. Okay. And likewise, if you have L1 entries, the sum of the uh, absolute values of the entries of matrices A and B turns out to uh, encourage the sparsity of the components A and B. So basically, uh, it is possible to take this, this matrix here, uh, this optimization problem over L, A, and B, and reformulate it by factorizing the L into a P matrix, pretty much like, so we write L if it is P and Q. If L is P equals P times Q, 
transpose. Yes, Q transpose. Uh, the L here is like if it is, uh, you can think of it like this. This is the P and this is the Q transpose, right? You factor it because it's very convenient to uh, solve it in a distributed fashion and online. But I don't want to go to the details. And then if we have prior information that is provided by historical data, which basically tell us the covariance metrics of the data, it allows us to form weighted versions of the previous one, which allows you to extrapolate. And I will specify what that means. Ex you understand what, what we are doing here? You give me x with holes and with unknown uh, predictions. And I go back and f I find L, A, and B. If I find L, A, and B, then I can resynthesize the holes, what is missing, right? And I can even predict for you what is to put on the right-hand side. Is that clear? OK. Let me tell you that uh, last year, I gave that in my university as an undergraduate uh, project. So people measured the power consumption at different buildings at the University of Minnesota. For four weeks, seven days a week, 24 hours, once per hour, they were getting a measurement. Some of the buildings had malfunctions and so on. So what you see, uh, the last day, so the last day, OK, we used all the days uh, 24 times 7 is 28, right? So 27 days that correspond to 650 hours we used in order to train the method to f for the X to find the LAB. And then we used the last day to predict what will be the correct consumption. As you can see here, from all sides, the solid ones signify the true and the dust our estimates. So you can see here how beautifully we have tracked all the uh, consumption in all places that were measured on the basis of that uh, law. In addition, there is a very important issue that I will elaborate later on, that the prices are very important to forecast, also much more difficult. So the issue is, perhaps you are not aware, but the, these programs, there are programs here, but a lot more aggressive ones are predicted in the near future that the price of electricity will change very rapidly and wildly. And how much you are willing to participate, or how much you are willing to use your photovoltaic or your, you can, if you're willing, let's say, in Barcelona to reduce your AC by two degrees, I may give you a little bit of discount or things of that nature. So uh, it is very important to uh, be able to forecast the price. Needless to say, it's important for the stock market, right, or to use forecasting. But even electricity has different prices. And you will see soon why the, how the differences emerge. But people are actively applying uh, even weather prediction approaches to price forecasting. So here, I just don't want to, to get you bored with the math. But uh, if you are familiar with the concept, we use kernels uh, to predict, based on some data, uh, the price of electricity at different times and at different sites. And what you want to see in the plot here is the root mean square error versus the actual prices from the Minnesota Midwest Independent System Operator, MISO. In the months of June to August 2012, we uh, 1,732 notes. And this is the novel method was this black, so you want to be low 
in terms of prediction error and we are the lowest than the state-of-the-art approaches uh, out there. Another, uh, this is my last slide before the break, another approach and another tool that modern power grid systems are enjoying to have is clustering approaches. How do you split the grid into pieces so that you can have more economic or safer or more reliable operators? Uh, so it's not necessary that I have to group people that are geographically closer or customers or generators. It may be smarter to mingle things on a different basis. So the, because you know, give me any vector, give me a bunch of vectors, we know that we have k-means that we can cluster it into different uh, groups. But for that purpose, or even for those of you that don't know k-means, we use the Euclidean distance. So we say I belong to this group if my Euclidean distance is smaller relative to the cluster representatives or centroids of the group. So the issue is what is the good distance when it comes to electrical networks? It's not necessarily the geographical distance. Okay? So these are things that are extremely important even for self-healing and eye landing under contingencies. So basically, you need to have plans whenever something goes wrong in a network, which one to cut so that it can operate on its own, so you don't spread the problem all over. So how do you cluster things is also another active area of research. So this wraps up my monitoring and inference you know, topics that uh, the modern power grid will have to uh, benefit from or expand upon. Okay. Next, in the, after the lunch, we're going to talk about for the second half on the uh, how the grid monitoring and learning leads me to op economic operation and optimization. So this is where we will pick it up from after lunch. Bon appetit. <laughs>